Hey everyone, I'm Megan Kelly. Welcome to The Megan Kelly Show. There is a lot of news to get to today and we have the perfect team to help us cover it all. The guys from the fifth column are here today. Among the topics we're gonna tackle, Tulsi Gabbard officially leaves the Democratic Party, torching them on the way out, calling them an elitist cabal of warmongers and cowards who try to divide us racially. I uh, think the party will get the message? Oh, I'm sure, right? <laughs> And an MSNBC host makes a stunningly racist claim, uh, arguing that Tua's recent concussion problem, you know, in the Miami Dolphins, proves the NFL is racist against black people. The only problem is Tua's not black. <laughs> She's not black. Hello, you dumbass Tiffany Cross. <laughs> She's the most racist person on television. It's amazing. <laughs> Maybe she just doesn't see color. Anyway, he's not black, but according to her, he is. Oh, and by the way, his coach isn't white either. <laughs> Cannot make it up. Uh, all this plus a Pfizer executive makes an admission that should be the final death blow to any mandatory vaccine requirements. It's all on camera. Mudwater is a coffee alternative with four adaptogenic mushrooms and Ayurvedic herbs. With only a fraction of the caffeine that's in a cup of coffee, you're going to get energy without the anxiety jitters or crash of coffee. Each ingredient in mud water was added with purpose. Things like cacao and chai for mood and a microdose, just a microdose of caffeine. Lion's mane for alertness, turmeric for soreness, cinnamon for antioxidants, and more. Mud is Whole30 approved. It's 100% USDA organic, non-GMO, gluten-free, vegan, and kosher certified. Boom. Mudwater also donates monthly to the Berkeley Center for the Science of Psychedelics, as they believe the country is in a mental health epidemic, and Mudwater sees psychedelics as useful tools for individuals with depression, PTSD, anxiety, and other mental health problems. Check it out for yourself at mudwater.com slash Megan, and that's spelled M-U-D-W-T-R dot com slash M-E-G-Y-N, and use that code Megan for 15% off. Joining me now to cover it all, our friends from the Fifth Column podcast, Michael Moynihan, a correspondent for Vice News Tonight, Matt Welsh, editor-at-large for Reason Magazine, love that, Reason, and Camille Foster of Freethink Media. Guys, welcome back to the show. Hello, Megan. Oh my God, I'm sorry. We were, I wasn't planning on starting with this more on Tiffany Cross, but it's so good. <laughs> Wait, I think we have the soundbite. Do we have the soundbite team? Okay, listen, yes, it's SOD 11. This is her railing on the mistreatment of Tua, with which I agree. I don't think the NFL has treated Tua or a lot of these players right. It's just one problem with her analysis. Uh, stand by, do we have it? SOD 11. I got to say, Mike, the optics just look bad to see all these black men crashing into each other with a bunch of white owners, white coaches and the complete disregard of black bodies and black life. I mean, it just represents a larger issue. This was in the context of Tua, but Tua's not black. <laughs> He's Samoan and his coach is mixed race, white, had a white parent, and a black parent. So anyway, he's not white. I guess in Tiffany's world, that's white. But in any event, this person sees everything, everything through a it's racist prism. What do you guys make of it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, anyone who's like watched. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I presume you guys defer to me because I actually watched the game. Uh, yeah, and I saw right. they hit. Right, and look, yeah. anyone who, who knows anything about the NFL is aware of the issues around concussions and has seen yeah. players kind of sacrifice themselves to stay on the field in circumstances that seem kind of less than safe and disconcerting. It's worth having conversations about all of that. But this is mm -hmm. just another you know, quintessential, perhaps, example of how you inject race into absolutely everything and you completely uh, dis discombobulate the conversation about what actually matters here. What we should be talking about is whether or not the health and safety protocols are at all suffi sufficient to help keep mm -hmm. players safe in these circumstances. We should be talking about the fact that it's not just head injuries. J.J. Watt, who's a defensive, uh, defensive end for I think the Cardinals um, had a similar sort of drama where he had a heart issue and then went out and played about a week later. 
think there are plenty of things that we could be talking about with respect to the NFL, but Tiffany Cross in so many circumstances seemed to only be able to think about one thing and one thing only in every single situation, and that is race. And here she kind of stumbles into it in a way that makes her look absolutely ridiculous since the gentleman that she's talking about does not identify as Black. He identifies as Samoan. But even if he were Black, she wouldn't have a point here. There is no reason yeah. whatsoever to make this Well, exactly, race. Camille. It's she makes sense. it sound like, it, you know, the, the white man who was not white, the mixed race coach, just went out and found a, back, a bunch of black bodies and started making <laughs> them bang into each other. It's like, it's also known as sports. Like, And by the way, not all the football players are black. Um, no. And they're all out there because it's a lifelong dream for, I think, every single one of them. They want to well be paid, there. Yeah. They're begging to be there and they're getting very well paid for it. Doesn't mean the safety protocols are perfect, but mm-hmm. she makes it sound like literally like a form of slavery. It's back to the Colin Kaepernick documentary of how this is just a modern day form of slavery. Yeah, I mean, it makes zero sense. People uh, who are excited about uh, concussions and NFL rules um, uh, would be advised to go watch a, a game from the 1970s um, uh, back when people were getting paralyzed <laughs> yeah. on, on the, uh, Stingley, yeah. on the, on the yeah. field. I mean, it was just a brutal game. Even I was, I was I saw on, on Twitter today, someone showed a, uh, a clip of like Tom Brady's rookie year. And it's so many decades ago at this point, it's different sport than it is now. The type of hits that were allowed on his white body. Is, yeah. Does he self-identify he, as white? He, he, as yes, Brady? I believe uh, himself yeah. as a whitey. Uh, yeah. He's a white, <laughs> um, uh, but the kind of, the kind of hits that were allowed. There. And back then there weren't as many, uh, black quarterbacks, there weren't as many black uh, coaches to the yeah. extent that blackness is real. Camille, I'm sorry. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, and yeah, it's just a, a different <laughs> sport. And I'm not sure what we gain by racializing the progress of rules over time. Do you do you mm-hmm. racialize like if you ever watch the NHL and there's like a fight because that's the best part of NHL? You're like, <laughs> oh god, look at the white bodies going after <laughs> bodies going after each other. <laughs> each other Northern face. European Finnish bodies. This, yeah. by the way, is the most offensive thing is that we really have to retire this idea that using the word bodies is somehow poetic and smart. Yeah. Yes. It's like they're <laughs> it's just the people. Is. Like it's like it makes them sound like there's some sort of lab experiment. They're doing it on <laughs> Audience, like, <laughs> fucking football players. I mean, come on. That's the other thing. Can we also say this one thing? I, I, I don't. I mean, I, I'm with both of these guys on this and the protocols of this, and you can cut down on it. But at the same time, it is football, and that mm-hmm. is what people have chosen to do as their profession. They are paid very handsomely for it. I don't want to see anyone get injured. I don't want to see anyone have any long term effects like that. You know, make them go uh, crazy and become suicidal and all the side effects that we know about. But you know, it's like MMA is the same way. You have a boxing referee who calls the fight because you know it's bad. You see what happens to boxers over time. You know, Jerry Cooney. I'd be a good example. Mm -hmm. Leon Spinks. I mean, it's part of the sport. And, you know, there's only so much you can do. And so the the focus on that is great. But the somehow the racializing it shows you the obsession with this stuff in the fact that people who talk about it all the time must look for it and find it all the time to justify their their even uh, when it's not there. Even when it's not not there. there. No, I mean, that. honestly, like even to his name, it sounds Samoan. Like she should have done like just a modicum <laughs> of research would have red flagged her that this might not be your target. Wait, wait, yeah. there, there, another target for you someplace, Tiffany, I'm sure. Um, but I agree with you fully on the point about bodies, the use of bodies. We're hearing that more and more. Um, <laughs> the, the black bodies must be centered in the football discussion. <laughs> is, that um, is that English? Yeah. Centering <laughs> bodies? Good Lord. Yeah. Ugh, okay. Um, also in the news today, um, Kanye West. And I'm so fascinated to talk to you guys about this because I ended Friday's show after Tucker's first first interview with him. You know, he broke it into two parts by saying, I don't understand half of what Kanye says. Like I just <laughs> why, I just sit there sort of like the dog with the cocked head. Like, I don't totally get it. I don't, I'm not sure yeah. I, if I'm too dense or I'm just not a creative thinker the way he is. You know, I'm this linear linear thinker, you know, legit logics um, and reasoning types of person. <laughs> yeah. I'm smarter than I just made myself sound. <laughs> you sound like anyway, yeah. my point is, he's, I get, he's, a, he's a creative genius. I get that. I get that. So I just sort of Thank shrug you. my shoulders and say, I guess I'm- acknowledging that. <laughs> yeah. I'm too- <laughs> dumb to understand, you know, what he's trying no, to say. Look, and then, I mean, yeah, you know, and then we had more comments over the weekend where I was like, 
am I still too dense to get it? Like, I don't, so just to, <laughs> just to get the audience up to speed on what the latest controversy is, and I'm sure you've heard it by now, but just in case, um, he's being accused of being an anti-Semite or having made anti-Semitic comments. By the way, two headlines on my fir- the first page of my outline for you guys are <laughs> Kanye West, anti-Semite or in a mel- mental breakdown? Joe Biden, nuclear oh, warmonger or in a mental breakdown? <laughs> 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 okay, so ca- back to oh. Kanye. On Friday, he went on Instagram and got into a dust up with Diddy, the, former, the artist formerly known as P. Diddy, Puff Daddy, whatever. Uh, and he said to Diddy, Diddy challenged him on his all uh, White Lives Matter shirt and told West to, quote, stop playing these internet games. Then Kanye responded, this ain't a game. I'm going to use you as an example to show the Jewish people that told you to call me that no one can threaten or influence me. Then he was kicked off Instagram. All right. So he was kicked right off of Instagram for that. Then he goes back on Twitter for the first time in two and a half years because he's apparently... I don't know. I don't think he was banned. I think he just hadn't been using it. Yeah. And... Uh, he, yeah, he just hasn't been using it. And he tweets out, I'm a bit sleepy tonight, but when I wake up, I'm going death con three <laughs> on, and then in all caps, Jewish people. The funny yes. thing is I actually can't be, <laughs> what are you saying, my aunt? I The funny thing is I actually can't be anti-Semitic because black people are actually <laughs> Jew also. You guys have toyed with me and tried to blackball anyone whoever opposes your agenda. And he was promptly locked out of Twitter. So no more Insta, no more Twitter, at least for now. Um, You know, I didn't know what to expect of his staunchest defenders. Like, I wasn't exactly sure how you defend that, you know, where people are going to go. I'll read you someone I think is an honest broker, Jason Whitlock, took a shot at it. Not sure Jason has solved the problem, but this is what he says. Kanye West and Dave Chappelle, is there a pattern The industry wants both of them canceled. So far, he's right. Black rappers and comedians are free to denigrate black people and white men a million different ways, but there's a line they better not cross and everybody knows it. And I actually did think when he wrote that, you know, and women too, right? You can say whatever that bitches and hoes and whatever they want to say about women is fine. But like, he's trying to make a point when you you bring Jewish people into it, it's a different story. Mm, All right, I'm feeling uncomfortable. Then- (laughs) He added, you can't question black entertainers unhealthy relationship with non-religious Jewish power brokers in Hollywood. Is that clear enough for you? And again, I'm like, "Mm, I don't know. What do you guys think? There's nothing better than coming at uh, somebody who is accused of making an anti-Semitic comment with one of your own, (laughs) which is (laughs) essentially what that is. Um, Yeah, I mean, that is demented. I mean, both of them are demented. I think that, you know, Kanye is obviously, um, and we've all been talking about this quite a bit, and Camille is a big booster of Kanye as a musician. uh, I would (laughs) say as a thinker, uh, because all of us talked about the general incoherence of the Tucker uh, interview with like moments of lucidity, but they're also just like, oh, okay, that's just a normal comment that he made. Uh, on the Jewish thing, I mean, this is... The Jewish question. D- yeah, yeah. yeah so, oh, no. Oh, this is no. like, this is definitely oh, anti-Semitic, I have to say. Um, <laughs> when you're talking about Jewish power, as if there's some sort of uniform kind of uh, maybe a protocol of an elder of Zion that actually makes these things. I mean, it is a, it is a classically anti-Semitic trope that Hollywood is controlled by Jews. Not that there's disproportionate numbers of Jewish people in Hollywood, that it's controlled, which is a different kind of idea, and that they are coming after me or us through this cutout of pity, P. Diddy, who's who or whatever the fuck he's called now, Diddy, sorry, it's wrong. Um, and that he is like kind of the Jews of the puppet master of it's it's so bizarre and controlling. It's like, well, you can't actually say anything about Jewish power. It's like, well, you can say things about individual people who are Jewish. I don't believe that their Jewishness has any uh bearing on mm, what they're doing. I don't think where, this is part that's of some, where it- you know, That's Jewish it. conspiracy is demented, uh, bonkers and wrong. And I think people who actually um, go to this point, what they're doing is they're saying, I mean, I saw that Candace Owens said something similar. They're taking a line, which is understandable in the broadest sense about identity politics. We can't talk about this. We can't talk about that. I get that instinct, but here it's not applicable because why it's not applicable is you're talking about a group and assigning a sinister agenda to a group. 
That is insane. If you said, you know, white people are trying to do X or Y, we call that out on the on the fifth column. And I think that you hear it on this show, too, is it if you say Jews are doing this also bad, um, but probably worse because of a very, very dark history of people mm, making those comments about about Jewish control as a minority, like the minority Jews are controlling the majority. It's a really dark, uh, dark uh, argument to make. And it's also wrong. Camille, I, and I, think- I know that you, I don't know, I don't know how to say defended, but offered another <laughs> piece to the story of, um, of Central Park Karen, uh, Amy Cooper, right? I mm-hmm. think that was her name, right? Um, well, you well, not the Central Park deep- Karen part, but yes, Amy Cooper. <laughs> yeah, no, sorry. That's how people know her. I know it's, I feel yes. bad for her that people call her that, but that's, that's, okay. that's how people know her. She had that confrontation with the angry bird watcher who got all, mm-hmm. you know, upset and, and so on and became very viral. And um, you told the other side, was the guy had a long history of harassing dog owners in the park and he had, thre- he had indeed threatened not just Amy's dog, but other people's dogs in the past, mm-hmm. blah, blah, blah. So, the, the problem I had with Amy Cooper, and, I, and you and I talked about this before, was was not that she said, I'm going to call the cops and tell them that you're threatening me, because he was. It was the fact that she said to him before she called the cops, she was going to mention his race. She said, mm-hmm. I'm going to tell them that a black man is threatening me. That's where she went off the rails. If she had just called 911 and said, he's a black man, he's 6'2", he's in the bramble, you know, like, that's one thing. And I think that's the problem with Kanye's comments, too. It's not just like you're being controlled by a bunch of Hollywood power brokers and then he names them and they all happen to be Jewish. He's like saying, I'm going after the Jews. I mean, like, it's different. (laughs) It's like, it's more in the, you know, I'm going to make your thing, your race or your ethnicity or your religious views an issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, look, I'll set the Amy Cooper stuff aside for a moment and and just talk about Kanye here. And, And I- I think it's important to acknowledge here that when Tucker sat down with Kanye, the knock on the interview was, why is anyone talking to Kanye? He's crazy. And then Kanye says something that seems kind of crazy. He tweets it anyways. Um, And it is kind of incoherent and seems a bit anti-Semitic. And everyone's like, well, we need to condemn that immediately. Wait a minute. Are we supposed to be not listening to this guy because he's crazy? Are we supposed to be condemning everything he says because we presume that there's kind of this precise racially motivated attack? And I should say cards on the table as I'm I'm kind of seeing my visages on the screen here. And I know that over my shoulder um, is Kanye's discography. Um, I'm a big fan <laughs> on the wall. Kanye wow. West. It's on the wall. I mean, I even have a, it's a Kanye bobblehead. Like that's Kanye oh West. Oh my gosh. I'm, a, I'm like a big, I'm a big fan of Kanye You're West big. music. Um, but that said, like most artists like aren't going to be brilliant intellectuals that have worldly knowledge about a range of important topics. Kanye's lyrics have always included kind of conspiratorial, like nutty stuff about like mm. the government administering AIDS for the purposes of killing black people. And even in that Tucker interview, when he talked about obesity and how we have kind of romanticized Rizzo. it, how there are people who won't be honest about the fact that if you are morbidly obese, this could kill you. He says that the reason why this is happening is because there's a conspiracy to kill black people, a conspiracy yeah, which he is second. attributing to white people. <laughs> This is, it's the same sort of preposterous language. And I would agree with you, Megan. It is broadly reprehensible that we traffic in this sort of stuff. But there is a sincere, fair point to be made that we actually do give people a pass to use this kind of categorical, totalizing language and even to engage in that kind of bizarre um, uh, conspiratorial musing when it comes to white supremacy and whiteness broadly. And we don't allow that when it comes to, um, with, to, to Jewish people. I would say that that's probably the appropriate standard for us to regard that kind of race mongering for what it is, whether it's Tiffany Cross or it's Kanye West, we say that's repugnant. That's something that people shouldn't be engaged in. I think some of the selective outrage about these things, and I do understand the unique history of talking about kind of Jewish people as puppet masters, that is gross and despicable. I think there's also a very high probability that Kanye West isn't familiar with that. Again, Jewish, Mm -hmm. black people are Jews. What are you talking about exactly? What? Is that like the guys who are in Times Square? The, yes. the, the, the yes, Hebrew Israelites that are black people? That's it, because that's, Again, that's how can argument, you take right? him seriously when he's talking yeah. about this? I love the music. I appreciate much of the fashion, but his insights on politics, I, I, I shelf them right next to like Bruce Springsteen's. I do not give a crap what they think about political that, issues. Isn't this the danger with conservatives sometimes? And somebody, a listener to mm-hmm. our show, 
who uh, sent us a message and was like, as a conservative, what do you pick, Kanye West or Kevin Sorbo? I mean, that's the thing, right? I mean, you have, you don't, there's like- well, a, I'm sure he's a nice guy. Nice guy, I'm sure he's lovely. I never don't know what he's in. But that, there's kind of a dearth of like conservative uh, famous people and particularly in the world of culture and people get excited. They're like, ah, oh, Kanye. One, yeah. And then he says things that about 40% of it is completely incoherent. Like, all right, that's fine. Just forget about that. He said uh, something <laughs> about, about uh, you so know, true. romanticizing obesity and Lizzo. And it's like, he also said it was demonic. Uh, yes. So I don't know if he's on the same. It's it's kind demonic of conspiracy to kill black people. Yeah, yeah. it was uh, yeah. Yeah. Indiana, <laughs> I think the Indiana attorney general or some Indiana Republican politician yes. after the yeah. absolutely bonkers anti-Semitic statement. It's like, you know, the, the media, they're just going after the truth. Who are the media, Matt? <laughs> <laughs> Ask <laughs> yourself this. this. So I, uh, I am someone who doesn't joke people, doesn't want to necessarily uh, sentence people to be in intensive therapy with Dr. Eugene Landy. I think yes. there's, I think there's a bad history of that. He was the very controversial crazy uh, psychotherapist who more or less imprisoned Brian Wilson yes. for about seven, eight years there in the late seventies oh. and early eighties. But Brian Wilson is a, is, a, was a seriously drug addicted uh, schizophrenic whose brain was broken by a bunch of different things. Um, and he was sort of taken out of, of uh, himself um, for intensive therapy. Uh, someone needs to put Kanye back on the no Twitter diet. Um, I mean, yeah. it's, there's something yeah. that is, is gross about um, uh, kind of exploiting uh, mental illness for whatever a reason. Um, it makes it a little bit uh, strange because both in the case of Kanye West and Brian Wilson, who aren't the same people, but they're both super artistic geniuses. And mm -hmm. it's possible that some of the wellspring overlaps there, but it's also truthful that it's awkward as hell. There was just a new Brian Wilson documentary that came out that he participated in and, and was, a, I think, an executive producer on um, that came out last year. And it's just really awful to watch because he's a, like a child um, and, and schizophrenic. And he's sort of um, he's exploiting himself in this sense. Um, and I don't like to watch it. And it's like that with with uh, Kanye. I don't I, I love his music to the extent that I'm exposed to it. And um, but I don't really want to see him talk ever again, unless mm -hmm. it's at uh, Hurricane Katrina um, yeah. fundraiser. George in which case, oh, uh, I'll just say one th there's one thing he said. He told Tucker that it hurts, quote, hurts his feelings when people suggest he's in the midst of a mental breakdown when he says these controversial things mm -hmm. um, or when they accuse him of being like bipolar. And this is what's driving his commentary. I mean, he I think he himself admitted that he has bipo bipolar disorder. Yeah. Um, in 2019, so that is a thing for him. Now sure. I don't, I don't know enough about bipolar disorder to know. I mean, my under my layperson understanding is you have manic swings and depressive swings, and I don't know that you're that you say things you don't believe in in one of those phases. Yeah. You know what I mean? It doesn't doesn't make you say things you don't actually believe in. It just makes it changes your mood, changes your approach, your conversation, your energy level, and you know your thoughts about life and what matters. Um, but either way, I think you're hitting the nail on the head with like, this is how I felt about him on Friday before he said any of this stuff. Um, he, I, my mind cannot connect with his mind. My mind doesn't work anything like the way his mind works. And so I really kind of have given up trying to understand him, you know, like I don't, I don't get it. Um, but I do think you can sort of appreciate this creative genius in our society and understand some of his eccentricities are connected to those gifts. It's kind of like, forgive me, but mm -hmm. like Michael, Michael Jackson, you know, or even like a Tom Cruise, you know, is like the Scientology stuff. These people get so big and they do have massive creative streaks that I certainly don't have. And there's something that changes them as a result of that and the huge success and the huge fame that follows. Yeah, and I think that's thing right. For you know, listeners, uh, just as a very brief only Camille talk is that our friend, frequent guest, and I know his father has been on this show, Megan, Ben Dreyfus, um, oh, had yeah. a great yeah. tweet thread yesterday about mental illness and Kanye. And people said, you know, hmm. I, you know, I know people with mental illness and it doesn't make them all of a sudden 
anti-Semitic. Ben has is very open about the fact that he's been institutionalized in the past and has a mm -hmm. very, very thoughtful thread about what bipolar and this sort of thing can do to one's um, you know, brain and, and make you paranoid and make you say things that you might not otherwise say mm -hmm. when you're not in a manic episode. Oh, but I recommend people people check that out because Ben I um, like him and I actually follow Ben's Substack. I just haven't read it from yesterday. I, I was just recently looking at the one about John Stewart, which I thought was highly entertaining, where he wrote, John Stewart will not <laughs> <Yes>. be president. <laughs> He's not going to be president, so Very stop funny. it. Take yes. a seat. Yeah. Ben is always no, he great. Is. Look, I, I, I'll say this. I don't think Kanye is crazy. Um, he he has acknowledged that he's bipolar. Um, I, I don't think most of us are just... None of us are designed for the sort of attention and adulation and criticism that people in a position like Kanye's endure. And I think it's it's easy to kind of chuck spears and to, to hurl ridicule at him, at Kim Kardashian, et cetera. They earn fortunes in many respects because they have such high profiles and the fortunes have kind of earned them those profiles. But it's worth having some sympathy and some empathy. Um, I remember, you know, when I first saw that Kanye was gonna be on a Tucker show, my first thought was, that this doesn't really seem like the sort of thing that I would want to do if I were producing uh, a news show to like take him and put him on broadcast television because a lot of the output on social media just didn't seem like a guy who was in a particularly great place. I mean, he was mm -hmm. in the midst of having these really public explosive arguments with people where he's denigrating them. He just broken up with Adidas and Gap um, in the weeks prior to that. Like he's... And filmed it and posted Seems, it. Yeah, I don't know it's if argument. I don't know if it, I don't know if unstable is like the right phrase, but at a minimum, he is making the kind of decisions and of great consequence in a way that if I were a friend of his and I was close to him, I would be encouraging him to take a step back. Like what you need at the moment probably isn't you know a national television audience and you know two hours of content that are going to be taken and dribbled out over the course of two days. You need a vacation. Like, let's get out of here yeah. so we can collect our thoughts and then come back to the public and continue your career. Uh, well, and the whole I don't thing know was, was, was delivered in a different way than that. Like he, his messaging on Tucker was, I don't want to be told that anymore. He kind of painted himself as a victim of cancel culture in the way that so many people have been. Like I self-censored. Yeah. I wanted to say a lot more about my admiration for Trump and so on. And I didn't feel like I could because of my industry, because they were all against him and because I knew I'd be called crazy. You know, I'd be yeah. called crazy. Yeah. So you, you, you have to be careful on the other side too and dismissing, you know, his opinions that are out there, not necessarily loving Trump or not. I mean, a lot of people feel that that way um, as a function of his bipolar disorder, but I will mm -hmm. take you on, on this. I do not feel empathetic toward Kim Kardashian in general. <laughs> I've been going on a tear over her for the past couple of days because every I time I open my paper, there she is again. And I find it deeply alarming. Like, what are we celebrating? Her enormous fake ass? Her yes. extreme yes, are, plastic Megan. surgery? No, no, we're, she's no. Not writing, I she's not writing the stories, though. Yes. She's mm -hmm. not yeah. writing no. the stories. Mm -hmm. I, I'll say this. Look, oh, I've met she <laughs> is too writing this. Stop it right now. She Here is. She has orchestrated okay. Every single one of the photographs you've ever seen. There isn't one the that was organic. Every single time the paparazzi has been called by her and lured to the location, and then she shows the bottom, and then she photoshops it, and then she denies that she's done any of that shit. And then little girls all over America are like, oh, why isn't my bottom five times the size that it is without any surgery whatsoever? I must be inadequate. And then you say, no, sweetheart, you're not. And every mother across America says, no, sweetheart, sweetheart you're not. But they continue to see these absurd, obscene images images of her. And then she's like, oh, you know, I, I'm sad that my my children's school was mentioned by Kanye. You're the one who puts them <laughs> on camera at every turn. It wasn't enough that you exploited yourself and you put out your own sex tape. We all know it. And then well, pretended yeah. to be a victim about it. But now you've got your kids at every public event. You put their faces on the camera almost as much as you put your own face on the camera to the point where your kids are trying to hide when you bring them to the fashion shows. They don't want to be public figures. So I don't feel sorry for her. <laughs> now, now, do you like Kim Kardashian? Yeah. I just I don't kind of get it. Sort of make sure that people understand. But is it you're a fan of her work? My uh, daughter. I actually watched uh, the show with my daughter, who was like, uh, "Can we watch it?" And she's 11, and incidentally, she's never said, 
uh, why is my ass not like that? Just yeah. in fairness. <laughs> but she, said she thinks it. She, said she thinks it. Yeah, she's a very good gymnast. Know. And that would be a difficult thing as a gymnast. But uh, she watched it and made fun of them the entire time. So that's when I realized hey girl, that I just uh, was yeah. not doing a terrible job as a parent because she watched this and was like, these people are absolutely ridiculous. I did once, by the way, um, it was assigned something for Newsweek, and it's in an old issue of Newsweek, where I watched the show. I had never seen it before, and I made the mistake of telling an editorial meeting that I hadn't. So they made me go uh, watch it and write about it. And uh, I came to a slightly different conclusion. The first thing, by the way, is I got the neurovirus right the day I started watching it. So I spent the entire time <laughs> watching it and vomiting, which is, was absolutely perfect. <laughs> and uh, it's absolutely true, by the way. And I watched the other end and I was like, you know, I mean, credit for being great business people. Not great role models, Megan. I don't think they're great role models. But, you know, I mean, people like it. I don't know what they're selling. I don't understand it. I don't pretend to understand it. But. You know, and you know, she she was good with uh, Trump and you know getting some people out of prison, which um, which I thought was there I were people total credit on deserved. Alice Marie Johnson. I do, I get that, and I'm mm -hmm. not saying she's never done good things, and I and I said that many times. You're just but talking about her. It, ass. There's there's <laughs> Kim Kardashian the person, <laughs> and then there's Kim Kardashian the brand, and the brand is dangerous. I'm telling you, the the Kardashian brand is dangerous. I, it's I'll done way more harm than good to young girls across this country, and continues to grow and become more influential. I mean. I will tell you, I, I've said this story in the air. My daughter and her little friend were in my bathroom with me one morning. I was getting ready and I was putting on my makeup. And um, the, the other little girl said, oh, is that is that by Kim Kardashian, <laughs> the makeup? And I was like, when I gave her the side eye, like, no. <laughs> no, it's not. And my daughter said, she goes, who's Kim Kardashian? And uh, I said to her, I do not meet... I do not wish to be the person who introduces this woman into your life. You know, yeah. <laughs> I, I really think that this group of people, and I don't think they have evil hearts. I want to say that again. It's different from, you know, some other bad guys in the news. But that brand has grown to the point where I think newspapers need to be really careful about splashing those photos all over the pages with impunity, because I do think we're setting a terrible example for our young kids. I mean, I don't, I don't want to belabor this. Um, I'll, I'll say this. I, I met, I met Kim. I met Kim once, um, and, and her mom actually. Um, and I'll say this: like the conversation that we had was about like her work in criminal justice reform. It was about her efforts um, with programs like the Innocence Project. Like she's she's incredibly bright. There's a very real sense in which the sexualization mm. and all that other stuff; those are legitimate things that one could take issue with. Uh, but I think it's worth acknowledging that there are other ways that they could be covered. These women, this family, like they're moguls. They built businesses, like legitimate Based businesses that don't nothing. have anything to do with those kind of Based other things. Based on nothing. Things. They're, they're brilliant marketers. Trust me, Camille. I know, I know they, the family. I went out there and interviewed all of them. Uh -huh. um, I, and I did my homework before I did that, as I do with everything. And th they are marketing masters. And I get it. They're in the beauty business. Which is something. But yeah. they have built an empire. But they've built an empire based on absolutely nothing. No talent. It started with her sex tape, which her own mother, according to the man in the document, the 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 film with her. I've seen it. Yeah. Um, put out there <laughs> with their consent. No, I mean, I've it's, seen Ray J talk about it. Take it easy. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I saw well, him talk well. about it. I don't watch that. I mean, what you do on your own time is up to you. <laughs> <laughs> really, the, the patriarchy is not working because Ray J did not get famous from that. I still don't know who he is. Well, this, the Ray J was already yeah. a little famous. He was more famous with her than her at the time that was made. But I think that's another yeah. point. The, their marketing, and it's, it's again, all of the kind of general degradation all the general criticism about the sex tape, about the over-sexualization, et cetera, all fair. But there are plenty of people who make sex tapes and plenty of people who might be physically attractive who haven't been able to eke out the kind of success that they have. Like, it's kind of an extraordinary only in America story, for better or worse. Well, and what true. it says about America might not be terribly nice, but I don't think that's their fault. I mean, there's a very kind oh, of God. long history no, of this, this sort is, of thing, this, this whether is it's what Marilyn Bridget Monroe. Fantasy was saying. Or Bridget Fennessy said, "Blame the players, or blame blame the game, not the players." And I really thought about it. It was just last week. I blame both. I mean, I I really okay. did. I, the game is wrong, and the players are wrong. The player the players do not get excused for being disgusting players. Go ahead, Camille. Mm. No, I'll say, I'll, I'll say fair, fair. I, look, I, I don't, I I don't want to belabor it. I, you know, I get, I get the point. And, and also, you know, I said that positive things about their business acumen, um, there's just negative things to be said about it too. I mean, Kim Kardashian was just fined over a million and a half dollars, yeah. maybe $2 million promoting, 
fake crypto being stuff. A tax cheat. Yeah. And there's been a bunch of things, you know, uh, those like uh, credit card stuff and apps that mm -hmm. kind of charge the parents. And so they've been involved in some some dodgy stuff, too. But the thing to think about with them is, you know, did they usher in an era or was this an era because of technology that was inevitable? Because right now, if you talk to young people, the Kardashians are they know who they are. They don't care about them too much. And there's a whole bunch of new people on TikTok in particular that they're obsessed with. And like I talk, mm -hmm. I've talked to a bunch of like young girls about this stuff for a piece that I did. And they're like, oh, this guy and he's got 25. I'm like, I've never heard of any of these people. These kind of like like they're not even micro celebrities because they're macro celebrities. They have unbelievable followings. And it's are, all those are the those are the women who came after. The, yes. They, no, that's what I'm they wondering. Are is disciples. It would that have happened anyway. Because yeah, of technology. I, I don't know. You know yeah. I don't know. But th these women have 100 million followers on Instagram, probably more. That was back when I interviewed them as 17 or 18. I mean, I'm yeah, sure it's exactly. greater than that now. Um, and I'm sure a lot of them are bought and paid for and all that. But still, the number's got to be huge if it's up, you know, at those levels. And they, they are at the heart of selfie culture. When you see these girls going out to lunch with each other and instead of just enjoying each other across the table, they're taking their own picture in 50 different ways instead <laughs> of watching the sports game or the movie or the band. They're making it about themselves and doing their stupid fake poses. I blame the Kardashians. Not entirely, but hugely. They had a huge role in it. They're all about selfies and the way they look and extreme, inappropriate, false vanity. It drives me insane. They're a force for evil in the country. Who's the antidote? I mentioned the Queen of England the other day. Like, who? Wh where is the distinguished, smart, fierce, patriotic, you know, businesswoman who we can point to as the anti-Kardashian? We don't have that. We don't revere women like that in this country. We take the big ass big boobed <laughs> women, and we give them a total pass for what they've done to the children. If they manage to get a great woman like Alice Marie Johnson out of jail, by the way, Kim Kardashian did not do that herself. Okay, there were a lot of other no, people. No, not on her own. Ultimately, it was and, Donald and she Trump. Would, she'd be the but she first called to attention that, to it. So that, yeah. was a, that was a blessing. I agree. That was a good thing she did. It was a mitzvah. But it doesn't come <laughs> close to overshadowing all the other stuff that she's done to hurt other girls, in particular, the young ones. All right, I'm sorry. Belabor, belabor. Um, I saw the last word. <laughs> just been that is a lot so of that. I don't know why. I, I didn't, did you know that Megyn Kelly was so angry at the Kardashians? I, it was like touching that nerve was the best thing that ever happened to me. I, yeah, I knew. Because I'm enjoying this. <laughs> I one thing. I have one question for you, Megan. I'm going yeah, to turn this around you. and pretend it's my show. I was in, the, uh, in, in a yogurt shop the other day. It was like in August. And I saw a woman uh, at the front putting stuff on her yogurt. And I said, that woman looks vaguely familiar. And the person I was with said, that is Bethany Frankel. And I was like, oh, yeah, it was Bethany Frankel. And it's like, oh, she's the real, like the OG real housewife. A lot That's of right. what you're describing is very much, because I've watched a few of those episodes, it is exploitative. There's people throwing drinks at each other, like behave horribly and you'll become famous. There are people who matter. They're all the men are like these trollish, horrible uh, men. And they're all married to like beautiful or once beautiful women who married them uh, clearly for money. It's a lot of bad messages for young people. Do you feel the same way about the fantastically entertaining kind of Real Housewives yeah. series? Because there's a lot no, of those. No, I don't. You don't. I don't. I don't th First of all, I, I think they have different audiences. I think the Kardashians wow. are for younger women and girls. And Real Housewives, they're fucking my age. I mean, it's like they're, they're yeah. for like people like me who want to put on candy instead of sports on Sundays and just have a little mindless TV. They haven't built enormous empires based on their fake boobs or fake bottoms, which they They'd then like deny to. are fake. Okay. You know, they, Why are you pointing they, out look, the they, two best things about Kim Kardashian and then <laughs> denouncing them? <laughs> <laughs> good stuff. Forget the bad stuff. It's not bad. I don't know. I, don't and even, I gotta thing. be honest. Even if Kim Kardashian said it's fake, it's all fake, I'd respect her a little bit more, but I'd still say you're dangerous. Like, would you please focus on your criminal justice stuff, which, you know, you could take issue with, too, dep depending on the, the person. But focus on your law. Why don't you do something with that law degree, which you clearly just did as a vanity project to try to make yourself sound like you were a little smarter than you actually might be. She failed the bar three times. Don't get me started. All right. She could actually do something. She could actually be a force for good, but she chooses not to. And the whole line behind her, it's just like the Meghan Markle thing. 
Meghan Markle targeted Prince Harry. She wanted to be a star. She rejected a couple of other British guys who weren't powerful enough. Then she was rejected by a bunch of them. How embarrassing for Prince Harry to have been the one who fell for it. What a dope. He, I mean, we had Tom Bauer on their show on Friday being like, Prince Harry's dumb. That's why he went for the one that like, I don't know, all these other soccer stars rejected and so on. But they, they were conniving and they saw a means to, to stardom, to fame, to being self-centered for a living. And the same is true with Kim Kardashian and her sex tape. They're, they, they're on parallel lines. And what's happened? We've rewarded them. I will give Kardashian this. She's not constantly running around like a victim, like Meghan Markle now is, having you know gotten the crown. She wants us to feel sorry for her. That's mm -hmm. the difference between the two. My God, I need to take a break. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you have, can you take Xanax at like 12, 30 or is that fine? Just serious. <laughs> that. Um, By the way, Megan Markle, I, I'll say this, she is the worst person in America and I just want that to be true. <laughs> and like, she didn't succeed. She's I never mean, gotten anyone Kardashian, out of jail. And the Kardashians, whatever you think of them, succeeded on their own. She succeeded yes. by marrying the ginger guy that used to wear a Nazi uniform. That, like, yes. she, he's oh, literally, God. well, he did. He used to look Literally. It it's, it's, it did. He it did. It's a costume. Yeah, and, and by the way, she's you know getting, and unlike uh, uh, the Kardashians, who really come in for it on this show, um, she's, <laughs> it's a pretty rough ride in the media, appropriately so, too, because... Uh, because yeah, not a, not a fan of the Markle, but um, well, I'm just and, you and okay, and I'm, she's I'm going to after this break as well because I got something to say on her latest podcast. Stand by, Ooh. we're with Yay. the host of the fifth column <laughs> right after this. Wow, <laughs> we're, at some point we're going to talk Russia. <laughs> Stand by. <laughs> Are you tired of feeling like someone's always watching you on the internet? Maybe the advertisers know just a little bit too much about you. Like back off, okay? Or you're just concerned about the privacy of your identity? Using incognito mode does not solve the problem either. IP Vanish VPN will. They are here to protect your right to privacy and to help you stay anonymous online. IP Vanish helps you safely browse the internet without exposing your private details to third parties like hackers, even your ISP, or advertisers. When you use IP Vanish, all of your data is encrypted. That means your private details, your passwords, your communications, browsing history, and more will be completely shielded from falling into the wrong hands. Even your physical location will be hidden. IP Vanish is offering an incredible 70% off their yearly plan for our listeners right now with a 30-day money-back guarantee. That's like getting nine months for free. IP Vanish is super easy to use as well. All you do is tap one button, boom, instantly protected. Take your privacy back today with a brand rated 4.6 out of 5 on Trustpilot. Go to ipvanish.com slash Megan and use the promo code Megan to claim your 70% savings. I-P-V-A-N-I-S-H dot com slash M-E-G-Y-N. So Meghan Markle's podcast uh, released another episode today, and this is really just a series of attempted victimizations. Like, women who are very successful, who she wants to repaint as a victim. From Mariah Carey to Serena Williams uh, to herself, of course, always herself. And today, what she's upset about is how women are sometimes called crazy. And I will acknowledge that it is a typical thing when you're trying to discredit any woman. There's a saying, nuts or sluts. They're either nuts or sluts, right? And so mm. if you can't say she's a slut, you find a way to say she's a nut. Now, that is definitely a tactic that is used by some people. But that doesn't mean that we need to get rid of the term crazy to describe women, because guess what? We use it to describe men all the time, as I believe we just spent about 25 minutes discussing <laughs> of the Kanye critics and his frustrations, right? So it does happen on, you know, to men and to women. But you would think if you listen to this podcast, my God, that women, we were still in 1870. We listen to the way, like how hard we have it as women and as Asian women, as black women, as, as crazy women. <laughs> and here's just a bit of how she sounded today. Raise your hand if you've ever been called crazy or hysterical. <laughs> or what about the guys nuts, are raising their hands? Insane, <laughs> out of your mind, completely irrational. Okay. Okay, you get the point. <laughs> now, if we were all in this same room and could see each other, I think it would be pretty easy to see just how many of us have our hands up. By the way, me too. Voice. And it's no wonder when you consider just how prevalent these labels are in our culture. Oh my God. Ugh. 
Everything is an attempt is to sound profound and deep and knowledgeable and wise from all her years of doing absolutely nothing yeah. <laughs> to try to explain to us <laughs> the other greatest offense she's managed to, managed to stumble on that she needs to solve. Can I just say, you know what? You know who called me crazy repeatedly? Donald Trump. Yeah, during that whole dust up that. that we had. You mm-hmm. know what I, I did in response? Absolutely nothing. I let it roll off my back and I was fine. And it wasn't a thing. And I didn't go on to do podcast after podcast on how I'd been victimized by being called crazy. This woman, <laughs> my God. She he became the president. the comment sections of the internet, <laughs> finds the most offensive one, and then makes it into a podcast. Yeah. Oh, anyway, man. you guys too, you've suffered. You've been called crazy. Raise your oh hand for the God. audience now. Jeez, I mean. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it up really with, loud and proud. With what hand <laughs> Actually, Nutty and slutty. It's an ac- accurate <laughs> description. So, I mean, there's no, the, like, if you care about journalistic truth, then uh, we have to call it that. What I love about it, besides her, her, you know, uh, like elementary school librarian voice that she was yes. using there, yeah. um, <laughs> is that that was written out. Yeah. That was yeah, absolutely, yeah. that was a yeah, yeah. word a prevalent. I, I will bet all my life savings was written for her mm-hmm. as she was attempting to sound like she was having a conversation with fellow women sufferers and things. Jesus Christ, everybody suffers. The the REM taught us in 1994 (laughs) that everybody hurts. Uh, Everybody hurts. We are are not just in the 1%, we're in the 0.1% in the world of fortune. Um, And she is in the 0.001% of fortune. But that's the point, right? And and to, to Megan's comment that everybody is coming on this show as somebody who has been you know, abused or suffered or, you know, the victim of an ism. And I look at that as one of the great vindications of America. It's a great patriotic point where if you go around the world, people who have been victims of things have nothing, you know, can't, don't have potable drinking water, don't have money are put in jail for having opinions or for being a certain race or a certain ethnicity or a certain religion. Whereas Meghan Markle doesn't realize from her billion dollar place in Montecito, she's interviewing the downtrodden other millionaires that are around her. And I don't know if you saw Sharon Osbourne had this hilarious comment that uh, Meghan Meghan Markle has one talent. She just wants to be around rich people. And you have to be at a certain (laughs) level of wealth. And that is hilarious when you think of the fact that she's talking incessantly about people who have been wounded by society, but they all seem to have an enormous amount of money. Not a bad society to live in. The second thing is I wanted to point out that I watched a video the other day, and your your listeners and viewers can find this, uh, from um, Ed, Emily Rata, Ratatouille, Ratatowski, the one that's uh, yeah. extremely Super attractive. Skinny. Yeah, yeah, and really dumb, but who thinks she's really <laughs> smart. And she had this uh, like selfie video. It's because God is which a fair was, God. It was amazing. And she was like, I heard about, but I haven't watched that Marilyn Monroe movie called Blonde. And I'm really tired. And she hasn't watched it. She's telling you this. I'm really tired <laughs> of Hollywood um, um, Vic, uh, like doing things to women's pain to make it like monetizable. And she's like, I own my pain. And I'm like, what is this woman even talking about? <laughs> you were like the hottest woman on earth. Like literally people give you <laughs> right. tons of money and you have no talent. You just were born with amazing the assets. And she's like doing this thing about how awful it is the pain of women. And we are in this moment where if you talk like this about pain and being called crazy, it's just utter nonsense. You don't need any data. There doesn't need to be a study to back it up. And everyone's like, that is really brave, Emily yeah. and Megan in Montecito. <laughs> it's crazy. It's That's cra- right. incredible. And again, everyone I know is you know, like, called crazy. And sometimes everyone. <laughs> sometimes they are. That's the people. thing. Yes, I've sometimes dated they most are. of them. <laughs> well, so this, you, you, she would take issue. This is going to wind up in her next podcast, this clip oh, right awesome. here. Because right. look what she singles out. Deb, this is the last of the three clips. The, look what she singles out as examples of how out of control our society is on, on women. <laughs> I feel like you guys think that we like choose to be crazy. You know, it's an active choice. A girl is allowed to be crazy as long as she is equally hot. Thus, if she's this crazy, she has to be this hot. <laughs> I don't think that men can control crazy women. Carla, I cannot hide the crazy a minute longer. I'm just this big mountain of cuckoo who's about to erupt and spew molten crazy all over him and he's going to die like this. She doesn't trust you. That is crazy. Let, let me tell you why. The use of these labels has been <laughs> drilled into us from movies and TV, from friends and family and even from random strangers. And the fact is, no one wants this label. Oh my Lord. How I Met Your Mother, Scrubs, etc. 
are on the evil list because they did this. And they had women saying it about themselves. And they had men saying it to women. Those are all comedies, by the way. <laughs> so oh, it's <gross>. like, <laughs> it's a yeah. joke. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Not, she's not fun. Well, it's the practice. <laughs> it's the practice helplessness that that bothers me. I have a young daughter. I, I worry about her inculcating these values. She's not a victim. She shouldn't think about herself that way. And she's not a victim on account of her being a female. It's preposterous. You hear yeah. it you release it and you move on. And I will submit to the jury that if it stays in there and it really gets to you, maybe connecting with some reality. The things that bother you when it comes mm. to like bad insults are the things that resonate with you for some reason. I'm not saying she's crazy, but she does go on to talk about her alleged suicide and how low she was and all that. Not suicide, but suicidal thoughts and how Harry had to rescue. I mean, like she's been on this for a while. Uh, meanwhile, you go back and you look at her lifestyle website before she met Harry and it was like, life is grand. Okay, pause, be right back. Much, much more with the guys from the fifth column. Like, are we about to go to nuclear war with Russia? Do you ever wonder if your vitamins are working, right? You just like, what are they, are they doing anything? Clinical studies show Healthy Cell's new ingestible gel technology called Microgel delivers maximum nutrient absorption, 165% more than tablets. Isn't that what you want? Maximum nutrient absorption. It tastes great too. It's hard to make vitamin liquids or gels taste good naturally, but Healthy Cell products are the best tasting pill-free supplements on the market. Go pill free and get up to 15 pills worth of nutrients in one ultra absorption gel pack, saving you money and time and giving you effective doses in the process. Take a single great tasting gel pack at home or on the go. It's great for travel. You can mix it into drinks or blend it into smoothies. Old fashioned tablets, capsules, powders, they contain synthetic other ingredients such as binding glues, flow agents, fillers and coatings that could irritate your gut. Plus, this is made in the USA. Visit HealthyCell.com slash Megan or code Megan when you check out for 20% off your first order. So um, back to the hard news, and that is mm, we may be going to nuclear war with Russia. Um, <laughs> not really, but according to our president's loose language, He's throwing around possibilities like that, like it's a nothing. I mean, haphazardly, this is not one of those things it's okay to have the White House staff come back two days later and try to clean up. We need really clear and careful messaging from the commander in chief on things like nuclear war. And uh, that memo clearly didn't get to our president, who said the following on Thursday about the possibility no? Okay. Oh, I've got it. It's not on camera. Um, who said on Thursday that we are looking at possible Armageddon, that we haven't seen. Um, I want to get the exact quote, but I don't have it in front of me. But that we haven't, we haven't been this close to Armageddon since 1962. That's how we put it. Since 1962. Now, what happened in 1962? It was the Cuban Missile Crisis. All right? So we went back, took a little walk down memory lane, and pulled some old news footage because it's always fun to see what was going on. Um, in 1962, when John F. Kennedy was president, and we had a showdown with the Soviets over them moving missiles into Cuba and pointing them at the United States. Uh, and that was the last very real possibility, and there was the whole Cold War after that, where we actually thought we might be heading to nuclear war with Russia. Here's a little bit of that old news footage. For some days before the presidential announcement, Lights had burned late in key Washington offices, as those most vitally involved in the nation's defense and security made ready to deal with the crisis. Well in advance, the Strategic Air Command had been put on super alert. Global disbursement and redeployment, increased in-flight readiness. Polaris subs, each with 16 nuclear missiles, would give added force to our announcement when it came. During the week preceding the president's speech, the Tactical Air Command had quietly repositioned thousands of men, tons of equipment, large numbers of fighter, reconnaissance, and troop carrier aircraft, mostly in Florida. Uh, I love that old news, news footage. Can't get enough of that stuff. Uh, managed to avoid nuclear war uh, back then because while Kennedy was advised to carry out an airstrike on Cuban soil in order to compromise Soviet missile supplies, uh, followed by an invasion of the Cuban mainland. He chose instead a less aggressive course of action 
in order to avoid a declaration of war, using a naval quarantine to prevent further missiles from reaching Cuba, and then tense negotiations followed um, in which he and the Soviets decided to to de-escalate uh, Khrushchev. And basically, the Soviets uh, would dismantle their offensive weapons in Cuba and return to the Soviet Union, and we would pull back and say we would never invade Cuba again. This is after Bay of Pigs. So in any event, it was a very scary time for Americans. And Joe Biden comes out, here's the exact quote on Thursday, and says, Putin was not joking about potentially using, quote, tactical nuclear weapons or biological or chemical weapons because his military is, you might say, significantly underperforming, end quote. He goes on, quote, we have not faced the prospect of Armageddon since Kennedy and the Cuban Missile Crisis. We have a direct threat of the use of nuclear weapons if, in fact, things continue uh, down the path they are going. Um, This is, I think, not okay. What do you guys make of it? Not okay. Um, reckless and said, I think at a fundraiser that uh, was, uh, am I wrong about yes. that? Or was it um, James Murdoch's house? No, um, right. a, a fundraiser for that. But no, I mean, the parallel is stupid and wrong. Um, very different scenario. I mean, if you look back in 1962, there was things to negotiate, right? I mean, that ended because the Cubans pulled their missiles out, uh, the Russians pulled their missiles out of Cuba and we pulled missiles out of Turkey that were uh, pointing at the Soviet Union. This is not a similar situation is that you have a country that's been invaded in Ukraine and the Russians are mad that they're losing. There's not a lot of negotiation that can happen here, particularly because Zelensky and the if you look at all the um, actually decent opinion polling that's happening in Ukraine, nobody in Ukraine really wants to negotiate this. They want to win, particularly because they right. are winning now to, for the president to say that we the guys he's serious. He, like that's not that's very very bad uh, uh, leadership and very bad diplomacy, because what we probably know about this, and I imagine people in the DoD and there's people who actually study this stuff, and people within the military, understand that this should be taken very seriously. You know, the Ukrainians are taking it seriously. They are handing out sort of anti-radiation pills to people, people who want them. But there's not a widespread panic. There's not a panic in the United States. There's not a panic in Europe where that obviously those dust clouds would go like like happened in Chernobyl in uh, the late 80s. Not, why is there not a lot of panic? Because I don't think people think, and rightfully so, that this is a logical option for food exist for these types of threats. You don't actually say, oh my God, he's serious. Armageddon. I mean, Armageddon is a word of panic. Do not say that to the American people that we're on the on the precipice of Armageddon. There is, you know, we can come back from this, but the only way of coming back from it is there's no negotiating with Putin on this, is this is what he wants, is that he wants to break the will, not of the Ukrainians, because he cannot do that. He's noticed that very for over the past, you know, now seven or eight months, that the Ukrainian spirit, if anything, has been emboldened by the psychopathic actions of the Russian military. He's trying to break the Europeans and the Americans. And of course, uh, you know, President Biden is, is, is walking right into that trap. Mm. But this just doesn't sound very libertarian of you. I would have expected you it to is say not. it's not no, a war, it is not. somebody else's conflict, no. you know, no, staying no. out of it. it, it you know, because the people who are in and libertarians who say this are disgraceful, um, who say that, you know, the, the people responsible for this war are anybody but the people in the Kremlin who invaded a sovereign country, brutalized their people. And as we've seen in the last couple of days, are punishing the fact that they actually, you know, have a better military. And yes, we're arming them and the Europeans are arming them, but they're doing quite amazing things with those arms because their homeland has been invaded. There's a kid from Novosibirsk does not want to be killed in Ukraine. The guy in Ukraine will die for his country. It's a very, very different thing. And now you have the terror bombing, like legitimate terrorism, definitionally terrorism, where the brave Russian military hit a playground yesterday, a university building, a bicycle bridge, things like that. The entire point, as Putin said, is revenge for the attack on the bridge connecting Crimea to the Russian mainland. And they're doing it by indiscriminately back against the wall, um, trying to terrorize the Ukrainian people. Anybody who believes that the Russians have, you know, or has some sort of sympathy for people who are doing this. And if you look at Bucha, if you look at all of these um, war crimes that we've seen, massive, massive numbers of war crimes that we've seen, you know, I said on the show not too long ago, America had a very, very long conversation about what happened at Abu Ghraib. There's about 700 Abu Ghraibs a day in Ukraine. 
And I think people that were anti-war, anti-interventionist, anti-imperialist, however they want to say it, were very, very interested in all of those war crimes, right? I mean, the 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 collateral murder video that was released by WikiLeaks, which is a you know a helicopter gunship mistaking a Reuters journalist for having an RPG, and then lighting them up, as I believe that the helicopter pilot said, that really, you know, changed a lot for a lot of people because it was a terrible thing to see. That stuff happens every day in Ukraine. I don't know why one can attack those things back in the day, maybe because it was George W. Bush that was was uh, the person believed to be perpetrating these things or was perpetrating these things versus um, the Russians and we're on the other side of it. No, no, the Russians are 100%, the, the, the Kremlin is 100% responsible for this. And, and make no mistakes, is that if you allow this stuff to happen, if you allow them to, you know, we don't have, a, we're not in a position to negotiate other people's sovereignty. So when people come and say, well, we have to come to a conclusion, like Donald Trump said this the other day, we have to come to, no, 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 the Ukrainians have to. We can assist them, we can advise them, we can help facilitate these things, but we cannot uh, you know, determine the fate of Ukraine. And for us to, to, to think we can, you know, an anti-imperialist bunch of people would say, America's always you know, putting its nose in everybody's business. Well, this is included. Do not tell the Ukrainians what to do with their future. They have done an amazing job of retaking an enormous amount of territory that was taken by the Russians. And um, I hope they take more and I hope they kick them out. And I hope they, they kick them out of even Crimea. It's, it's a, it's mm. a, it's, it's disgraceful. That's the resident. You know, old. but what's scary about it is, I'll, I'll give you the floor, Matt, but what's scary about it is, it was speaking of the Cuban Missile Crisis, you know, Kennedy got out of that. He got us out of that by realizing when your enemy's in a corner, you've got to give him an off-ramp. Otherwise, the worst will happen. And they did. They did. So he gave him an off-ramp and they took it. And we cut a deal that both sides liked and it led to a nice little period before the Cold War. But how do we facilitate an off-ramp that would work for Ukraine, that would work for Putin? I mean, is your, are, do you think we just, we just don't? Like yeah, the Ukrainians, are, I, and I understand the position is, the off-ramp is get out, Russia, get out. Yeah, yeah. But, but if it, he's not willing to do that. A quick, a quick thing on that is that, you know, I understand that. And that, and that of course was actually pretty, you know, interesting and, and impressive diplomacy in the Cuban Missile Crisis. But you had two people that, as you mentioned, were in a Cold War, not a hot war. So they made the off-ramps were, were slightly easier. What you, if you want to see a Russian example of this, the Russians in 1945, um, they had been, you know, the Great Patriotic War, they had been brutalized incredibly by the Wehrmacht and the, the German army, and they were coming, sweeping back, and they did amazingly horrible things, and they did nothing. There was no off-ramps. It was unconditional surrender. We were going to take every territory, Hungary, Estonia, et cetera. And there was, to them, there was like, this was the only option because they had just fought a brutal war and you saw what happened in Stalingrad and Leningrad, et cetera. There's a version of that right now in Ukraine. And I'm not saying that, you know, if I had my druthers, I would offer an off-ramp, et cetera, if I was in that position. But the Ukrainians are pretty united on this front because of what has happened, because of the images they see every day, because of, you know, people waiting in line at a train station being blown up by an enormous missile. And, you know, you see children's shoes and clothes scattered around and people's, you know, uh, you know, broken bodies on the ground being being hauled off. I mean, this has had a profound effect. And, and look, the Zelensky administration, people close to me have said this, it has a profound effect on the off-ramp. If there was, as people say, a point of negotiation at the beginning of this conflict, and there was points of negotiation, I don't think they were very serious, there is no points of negotiation now. Why? Mm. Well, it's because of what's happened. And what has happened is that the, that the Ukrainians do not want an off-ramp that actually cedes any of their territory because they believe the entire conflict is the fault of the Russians and it's morally wrong to take somebody's territory. I get that. I'm not saying I would do the exact same thing. I'm just saying that that is uh, definitely how the Ukrainians look at it. People mm -hmm. forget that the Cold War wasn't just like uh, people from a, a distance issuing stern communiques with one another. That's not how it went. I mean, in addition to being completely inappropriate for an American president to elevate the pathetic attempt uh, at using a nuclear arsenal, arsenal as a deterrent to allied support for Ukraine. In addition to that, it's just factually untrue that we are closer to Armageddon now. It's, I get that it's, it, it's a, a queasy-making moment. Nobody likes it. It, it. I feel bad and worried about a lot of things right now. However, I'm old enough to remember the Cold War. The Cold War had hot shooting wars with Americans in them against soviet backed countries there's a whole thing called korea you check it out it happened after world war ii um it was a hot war there was a series of hot wars everywhere 
There are proxy wars all over Africa, all over South America and Central America between the two sides. There was obviously Afghanistan. And so and, and all these moments of, of tense nuclear exchange, uh, not exchanges, but uh, negotiations, um, people were dead worried about a, uh, a, a nuclear holocaust and Armageddon all throughout the 80s. My God, I, did you watch a movie? Did you see a television series? That was constantly part of the culture, and it didn't come yeah. out of nowhere. It was, it was part of what was happening diplomatically. We didn't know that it was all going to suddenly collapse in 1989 through 1991. We assumed it would go like that forever. So part of this is that uh, I don't want to say that we've gotten soft, but we've forgotten what it was like to live back then uh, under that constant kind of threat while people were dying in a lot of places. And one small brief point on this on the nuclear question. Um, the sovereignty of Ukraine was, and this is very often overlooked, and, and for some reason, nearly it's it's nearly ever pointed out, is that the Budapest Protocols in 1994, the exchange was that the Russians, Europe, America would recognize and basically defend Ukraine's sovereignty or allow Ukraine to be a sovereign country if they gave up their nuclear arsenal. At the, at the breakup of the Soviet Union, so much of those nukes were in Ukraine that Ukraine, I believe, at the time became the third largest yes. uh, nuclear country. And so in exchange for giving up those weapons, which they did, and probably would be quite helpful right now in, in a nuclear mm -hmm. showdown, uh, they were assured by the Russians that um, Ukraine was an independent country. And that's important to remember because those treaties uh, don't get to go away when you decide that they go away. Right. I mean, those are the, the, those have people's signatures on them and they should mean something. They don't mean anything right now. But it was because of the, of the nuclear question that that their sovereignty was actually guaranteed in the first place. Wanna want to tell you that. Uh... Of course, there was the attempted cleanup by the White House. The next day, Karine Jean-Pierre comes out. Uh, the president's comments did not reflect any new intelligence. Boy, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> or any old intelligence for that matter. <laughs> Pentagon so spokesperson God. John Kirby, the, his comments were not based on specific new information. We don't have any information, in fact, that Putin has made that kind of a decision, nor have we seen anything that would give us pause to reconsider our own strategic nuclear posture. Um, he just says the president were, was reflecting the very high stakes that are in play right now. So, again, he was reckless. And what does he do as we're on the brink of Armageddon? He goes to Delaware, but fear not, because you know who's on the case of Ukraine and the situation there? Randy Weingarten. Yes, Thank America's God. diplomat, the yeah. carer in chief of children, has gone to Ukraine. I don't know why. For a photo op, to improve her own image, undoubtedly. Um, she's giving out some books to the Ukrainian children. Okay, whatever. This is her trying to improve her own PR. Meanwhile, uh, you know, back here in the United States, the children that she's actually supposed to be, you know, looking out for are at record lows on our test scores, on our math scores, on our reading scores. They just upped like the, the nation's report card in absolutely dreadful numbers that she actually is responsible for. She's abandoned all those children. As somebody said, um, the kids in Ukraine can't go to school because of an actual war. The kids in America haven't been able to go to school because of Randy Weingarten. <laughs> so you feel better. I'm sure I can see it on your faces. You feel better. <laughs> you see her comment where she was in Lviv, in the kind of beautiful center of Lviv. And uh, she, she said, uh, first of all, she kept on saying Putin, which is a very weird pronunciation. Oh. She was saying Putin and Putin. And she, the best thing about it was she said, you know, I was invited here. Okay, maybe she's invited. And uh, there's been uh, missile attacks overnight and uh, the schools are closed and the kids are learning remotely which oh, I thought was an amazing <laughs> Americanism in like this, the schools are being bombed. And she's like, yeah, they're it learning works. remotely. I was like, that, what an it amazing, works, but she actually had this, <laughs> she had this other tweet where she said, you know, the, there's been attacks in Ukraine and I'm, um, I'm heading to the border to check it out. She actually literally tweeted that, but like, what's the <laughs> <Yes>. border? Oh <laughs> my God, can you imagine? Check it out. Who are These you? Ukrainian soldiers are probably like, who is this annoying lady? My God, and why is Mark Hamill from Star Wars here? <laughs> Why is it? Well, well, did you see that? that? I like him. <laughs> that was the weirdest twist in the Ukraine news. It was like Mark Hamill from Star Wars said that oh. President Zelensky called him personally to ask him to be like a drone, dro dro a drone administrator. Hold on, we actually cut it because I was like, "What the hell is happening?" It's soundbite uh, eight. I'm not used to be 
being contacted by world leaders. You know, I, I'm, I'm a court jester. <laughs> I'm, I'm a non-essential worker. I do cartoon voices and TV and movies. So I was honored to be contacted by him. And basically what they were wanting me to do was become a so-called ambassador, which is a glorified word for representative of their army of drones. Because I was surprised he spoke to me as long as he did. I thought, my gosh, this is a man that has a lot on his uh, agenda. Uh, but he took the time and uh, who knows? I mean, uh, Maybe he's just a Star Wars fan. Oh, my God. <laughs> he's not used to oh, being I contacted by casting agents. <laughs> oh, jeez. Oh, jeez. I mean, apparently it's worse than we knew in Ukraine for Zelensky to be reaching out to Mark Hamill and Randy Weingarten. Like, I, like the Vanity Fair cover. I'm not sure this guy's being advised well. I realize I he's a former remake. actor. He's a star, but I don't think this is the way to win the hearts and minds. Am I wrong, Matt? Yes, because <laughs> what what is allowing him to fight besides the fact that all Ukrainians are like conscripted to fight? You can't leave the country if you're male at mm -hmm. this point. But also they all are really enters. This is what happens when your country gets invaded by a bigger bully next door. You kind of want to fight back and punch him in the mouth. So they're fighting really hard. That's great. But we've also sent them sixty seven billion dollars mm -hmm. um, yeah, and we could send them really quickly a whole lot more and probably will be. And that is the most important source of funding by far. I mean, we are dwarfing everybody. Can we still say dwarfing. No. OK. You can't. Uh, we, are, <laughs> we are little, little people. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Everybody <laughs> little people people right now. Yes. Very good. And also he needs that lifeline to be open. It's literally going to be a lifeline because uh, it's going to be pretty hard for a lot of Europe to continue supporting Zelensky. Poland will. The Baltics will. The, the Czech Republic will. A lot of them will. Um, but uh, there's going to be a recession and there already is a recession, but there's going to be a bad one probably this winter with uh, energy supplies coming in. And there's going to be a lot of people starting to get wobbly. So he needs to keep by any means necessary. People are always mocking him for showing up on award shows and doing this um, in America. And it's it is ridiculous. It's inherently ridiculous. And also, we are giving him all the guns to fight his war. He needs to keep uh, that. Then open. you get the rock. OK, a, I'm just saying, yeah. like, if you want to get somebody who Americans are going to listen to aim a little higher with respect to Mark, right. I'm like yeah. just a little higher. I don't, if he says he's doing like voiceovers on cartoons. <laughs> oh, God. Say Kim Kardashian. Um, <laughs> yeah. He's trying Thinking to be practical drones. with his uh, sort of diplomatic efforts there. Look, I, I would say that I just briefly agree broadly with what's been said here. I mean, Kiev is what was getting pounded yesterday. This is what, 500 odd miles from the Korean um, Crimean Peninsula. Uh, it's 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 a major deal. I mean, this is not kind of a strategy to the extent there's a strategy being employed by Putin. It, it appears that the strategy is just attacks of reprisal on civilian centers, not to try and take out any. This is demoralization by targeting civilians. It's grotesque. Um, and at the same time, the one thing that I've kind of continued to be very concerned about is the degree to which I don't hear um, a lot of public officials like a Joe Biden, who the one thing that we were promised when Joe Biden was running for office is that the adults were back in charge, that we would see mm. a more kind of steady hand at the wheel and that the, the rhetoric coming out of this White House perhaps could be anticipated, that we could expect it to be a bit more mature. Um, I would expect to see more kind of public declarations. I can appreciate strong support for the Ukrainians, but at the same time, also just the importance, the urgency of bringing an end to the conflict. Um, of, of, of bringing some sort of close to the fighting itself, which obviously the United States nor any other European government um, is, is able to simply declare unilaterally that this can happen. Um, but certainly once you're arming a side in the conflict um, and providing them with some, some advice and guidance in other contexts as well, there is some responsibility to try and help bring this whole thing to some sort of resolution. Um, and that resolution may or may not involve the, the complete kind of territorial integrity of Ukraine being as it was mm -hmm. before the conflict began. Um, and to the extent they can encourage Zelensky to accept some sort of compromise, however distasteful it may be to him, that might be in the interest of the Europeans broadly and of the United States of America more broadly. Uh, Camille, yeah. God, God forbid, God forbid. Yeah. 
Putin <laughs> uses strategic a nuclear weapon, a tactical nuclear weapon, because th- then now you're going to have NATO countries getting involved. I, it's, I mean, that is the last thing we want. Something needs to be done before that happens. Let me just pause it there because there's so many, so many other things that I tease that I want to get to. And we spent a good deal of time on Russia, um, and that is. Uh, let's let's go with this because what you talk about maybe, does does Joe Biden walk it back? Does he walk back those comments? Does he walk back? I mean, we always talk about the White House walking back his comments, and on the subject of the president and his messaging, he literally walked back the other day. Every day, it seems there's a sign that sends shivers down the spines of American voters about how well our president is. I mean, from the Armageddon comments to forgetting about the dead congresswoman the other day to the constant meandering and wandering and losing his train of thought, um, he's mumbling, mumbling now. I mean, it's really genuinely getting alarming. And the polls, there was a poll that just came out that shows, um, okay, in August, overall, 59% of Americans said they had concerns about his mental health. Now it's up to 64, all right? It's gone up five points. And guess where all the gains came from? Democrats. Democrats are up. Um, they make up the difference because even they now are seriously concerned about whether our president is all there. This, as video comes out of the president taking questions on, I think it was OPEC, and how they're giving us the middle finger after we went over there and did the fist bump, and the answer was pound sand. Um, watch this. Watch watch how he literally backs away from the lectern. No, the, the, the trip was not essentially for oil. The trip was about the Middle East and about Israel and, and rationalization of positions. But it is a disappointment, and it says that there are problems. Are you worried about it's a oh, no, oh, no. Oh, no. What's happening? Oh, no. Oh. That, that's moonwalking. So that, that's what that is. <laughs> Do you think that maybe he had one of those smoke bombs and he was supposed to go off and he was just like back away into the class? <laughs> like a magician? Wow. That is terrible. so much better. Wow. Somehow that's wow. worse okay. than the congresswoman thing. You know, we, we can still hey, see walk you. Walk backwards, Joe. Walk backwards. In his ear. We can still see you. <laughs> I hope so. Look at him. Watch him. Here he goes. No lectern, by the way, just standing just in front of the scrum. Go. Oh, okay. oh, man. Here he goes. Otis, walk backwards. Thank you. Walk backwards. There you go. <laughs> you need an air always to be close enough to come grab you. Say, you got to go, Mr. President. I don't even know so what it is. is I just walking thing too. It's like on the podium. So many of those clips yeah. are him trying to find ways off of podiums, which is kind of troubling. It's not the hardest thing in the world. And to Megan, to your point, it's like those numbers are increasing, maybe. Because the president is talking about Armageddon and everyone's talking about the, the potential of nuclear war. And you kind of want to have a on the, uh, on the tiller there, don't you? And mm-hmm. now people hopefully will be taking this seriously because the buck does stop with the president. And you can't say, well, Mr. President, we're not going to listen to you because, because you're old and a bit batty. Um, he can make some pretty bad decisions right now. And it's pretty yes. terrifying. It's not just, you know, 1994 Bill Clinton or something where the world was a, no. a little... Well, at least he has a really The stakes are very high. Say again, Matt? At least he has a very coherent vice president. Oof. (laughs) Jeez. I mean, it was near near the beginning of the conflict (laughs) when Biden was talking openly about assassinating Putin or at least suggesting he needs to go. He needs to be taken out. Like, what are you doing? (laughs) What are you doing? I think we should cut that clip. We should cut that clip of Biden walking back and that should just be like the theme video for the Biden presidency because that's what his staff does (laughs) after every single one of these nonsense comments. Walk it back. What? No, I didn't. Put the Benny Hill music on top of it. (laughs) (laughs) Or the uh, Larry David music. Either one of the two. (laughs) That one I've got at the ready. Do, 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 do. All right, here's... While we're on the subject of politics, can we talk about Tulsi? Tulsi, you're going to be shocked. Shocked Tulsi's everybody. No more of a, she's no more of a Democrat than Liz Cheney is a Republican. Take that to the bank. Uh, she's <laughs> leaving the Democratic Party. Um, I don't know if we have this on camera, but she says she's done with them, that they're a bunch of basic grifters. Um, she happens to be coming on the show later this week and coming out with a book as well. But I think she thought this was a good time to announce it. I don't think anybody's surprised. But mm-hmm. it's sad to me in a way because we used to have centrist Democrats and that used to be allowed. And I think she was chased out of this party, first by the Clintons, then by Nancy Pelosi. She outlined it the first time she came on this show, but she was just too centrist for them. They considered her a threat. 
and they got the hell rid of her. I mean, even though she kind of like Bernie, which isn't that all that centrist, but my point is like, she wasn't like, a Clinton was a acolyte. Bernie, Absolutely. She was, no, she's, I mean, she's, was for the Green New Deal. She was a Bernie bro in, in 2016. She was vice president of the DNC. She was a person of some heft um, and universal health care. Uh, I, I think that Tulsi is, uh, has always been kind of a party of one. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I, I, as someone who even wrote a book about uh, political independence, I always uh, appreciate people who are themselves independent. But she has an element of like, I'm being heterodox over here. Look at me, new mm-hmm. new book and uh, and podcast coming out uh, uh, near near you some uh, sometime. She I, she's a little bit over the map right now, and and seems to be trying to land kind of closer to Tucker Carlson's like desk. Um, and on her emphases and some of her politics. So I don't know if she was really forced out. Um, some of her objections are things that a lot of people are objecting to the Democratic Party right now. She's uh, very specifically went about how they're too woke and all of this. And I think you see a lot of uh, kind of the Latino disaffection with the Democratic Party, particularly down south in Texas. Part of this is they don't like the cultural messages being sent by the kind of elite top down. And Tulsi has always had sort of um, that kind of response. She has a different background than a lot of people and is out there in Hawaii and has a little skunk and a hair thing uh, as well. But I don't know if it's a harbinger of anything besides Tulsi's own uh, idiosyncratic career. Maybe of a third way. I mean, this is definitely kind of third way politics now when you say, oh, you know, Joe Rogan is conservative. Tulsi Gabbard is conservative. There's a number of these people who are, you know, Brianna Joy Gray, who used to also work for, for Bernie Sanders. And a lot of these people at the Jacobin magazine, you know, kind of left wing magazine who all want universal health care. They're very big government type people. They don't like wokeness and they don't like American foreign policy uh, when it's George W. Bush or when it's Joe Biden. So you have this kind of third way of people that were conservatives, that many of which were kind of neocons back in the day. I mean, Sorab, mm-hmm. our friend Sorab uh, Amari is a very a, a, a version of that, who was calling for the liberation of Iraq and Iran, and now is like the only two people in America that can save the Republic are Bernie Sanders or Donald Trump. That's a definitely an emerging poll in American politics. I don't know what it is, because like, I mean, when you said, and I think that you're right, and I don't know how to reframe it, but Tulsi is a centrist, she's something, right? She's heterodox in a bunch of ways. And she's kind of on this side and that one and this side and that one. And like Matt, I like political independence, even when I disagree with her and I vehemently disagree on her with a bunch of stuff. But I do appreciate the fact. And by the way, that is definitely the doing of Donald Trump because Donald Trump came in and destroyed the idea of what American conservatism was. And it was kind mm-hmm. of backwards casted in a way where American conservatives then decided to create an ideology based on what Donald Trump was talking yeah. about. And that was, you know, anti-free trade you know, anti-immigration, anti-foreign intervention. These are a lot of kind of mixed things that wouldn't have been traditional Republican positions. Pro-welfare t- state. Pro-welfare state in a lot of ways. And, you know, I always point this out. Donald Trump had, the, you know, Republicans put their uh, replacement for Obamacare on his desk and he sent it back saying it was too mean. It wasn't generous enough. And like, that's a, that's a very unique uh, thing that's happening in American politics. And Tulsi is, is definitely someone who's following one of those paths. She is um, Samoan. So how many seconds until Tiffany Cross says another black person forced out of the Democratic Party <laughs> by these absurd white men like Obama? <laughs> I don't know. She's, um, saying, she's complaining about anti-white racism. Right? Yes, so, she did say that, didn't she? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, she did. You know, and that's you're not allowed to say that. But of course, we all see it everywhere. I know you guys have been talking about uh, that kind of thing and, and anti-male chauvinism. Um, and all the narratives that we've been seeing about women this, women that, and Meghan Markle, every single woman who ever succeeded in America is in fact a victim. You need to reevaluate your worldview. Meanwhile, it's like guys aren't graduating from high school. Guys aren't getting jobs. Guys are overwhelmingly the ones who kill themselves. I, I talked about this on the show last week. And we just have to continue saying girl power, girl power, girl power. Um, to me, that's another massive problem that we've got in our society that you guys have been calling some attention to. Well, I think one part of it is just uh, the it start. The numbers are just startling, um, well, especially when you compare it to 20 years ago. The um, the number of people who are working, dudes and uh, women as well. Women are starting to go down recently, but uh, but it's been a flight away. Like uh, you know, uh, uh, 20 years ago, something like 55 percent of of teenage 16 to 19 year old uh, males were working. It's 
which it did. And now that's like 33%. It's going down and it goes down in every single cohort up until age 55. And then those dudes are working more. Um, uh, and that's interesting. And it's also interesting that, and this is male and female too, um, people, young people will describe themselves um, as being uh, feeling like too injured, either uh, actually or psychologically, to be able to work. These are like the average 27 year old describes themselves basically as being more disabled than the average 57 year old, which says to me that wow. there's something really wow. weird going on with our conception of work. If we don't inculcate a work ethic um, uh, anymore, you know, where half the people don't have jobs before the age of 25 now. I, when did that happen? It used to be two thirds of them did. Um, so yes, a lot of that is part of uh, the male feeder thing. And that's a, a trend line that's been increasing. And there's a couple of books out, Richard Reeves and Nicholas Ebersat and other people yeah, uh, are yeah. looking at this, but the flight of men from work um, is a bad thing um, uh, in and of itself. I, I, I don't, I'm not one who wakes up in, in the morning and says, you know what, we got to defend men right now. Um, <laughs> I want men to, you know, get up off their ass and go to work too. Um, but we also should recognize when a problem is staring us at, at, in the face. And this one absolutely is. I think that the impulse has to be to address ourselves to people's needs, people, individuals, whatever, the, whatever their gender, whatever their race or ideological background, the remedies to the problems that people are facing in their lives and their particular communities, the structural impediments to their success, to building wealth, to, to being trained and properly equipped for the kind of jobs that are likely to be available in our, in our, com in our communities um, and in our economy going forward. Like those things are generally going to be gender and race agnostic. It has something to do with family structure for sure. I mean, if you're a single parent household, whether you're a man or a woman, things are going to be slightly more daunting for you. But if we could start to think about people's needs and not their identities and the particular communities that they are said to belong to, I think that would go a long way towards helping to improve outcomes for more and more Americans and, and allowing us to actually fix problems. Um, it but would. We, we haven't been able to We're get out of our a different way. way. Yeah, we're going a different way. And I will give you a great example of how uh, right after this quick two minute break, more with the fifth column guys coming up. And by the way, last time we talked about pumpkin spice latte and whether I was for it, I'm going to try my first one right here with the guys. We'll find out. I had a big debate about it last time when they were on. You guys will be with me and I'll tell you what, how it goes. Stand by. So uh, we're less than a month away from midterms and the get out the vote effort is in full swing. And Michelle Obama's group, um, When We All Vote, that's her initiative, is working with the BLK Dating App. The BLK Dating App is designed for black singles looking to date. And they have a new video out that is meant to inspire young black singles, not only to date, but to vote and warn that if you do not vote, you do not get to vuck. Here's the BLK app looking for some action. Why the homie Scott was heavy. Faces are nine, abs are ten. To be determined. He got mad jokes. He don't seem broke. The only red flag is that he don't vote. This midterms for all the single cute. Wanna hit this booty, gotta do your civic duty. No voting, no loving. No voting, no touch. No voting, no nothing. No voting, no fucking, no voting, no fucking. No voting, no loving. Oh my God. <laughs> if, Can I tell you the best? Oh my God. If I abstaining from voting means <laughs> I abstain from having sex with those people, I'm never going to vote again. <laughs> just, the exact opposite of, oh my Lord. <laughs> so here's the greatest. I listened, you know, my, my team puts together these great packets for me uh, when you guys come on and when everybody comes on. And sometimes I listen to them. So you hit mm -hmm. Microsoft Word, you download it as a Word document, then you hit Read Aloud. And you got to hear that song read on the Read Aloud. Oh my God. No voting, no bucking. No voting, no bucking. No bucking, no touching. All right, so uh. here's some of the lyrics. Don't stop now. Stuff my ballot box again. But my <laughs> homegirl... <laughs> My homegirl, though, put the buy in, by, in partisan. Politics be so nasty. Make me want to flirt you. Show you how to be a poll worker. Uh, legs in the air. I don't care. Anyone can get it. Universal health care. If you want to uh, come before the deadline, come in this jacuzzi. Gerrymander in this coochie. <laughs> That's pretty good. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. 
<laughs> oh, Trina. So I, mean, I really feel like they're uplifting Gary the dialogue. Vander they're really. Yeah. yeah. What, what do we make of this this beautiful attempt to reach out to young black voters? <laughs> I think if certain people have decided that they're going to abstain from voting and they're perhaps abstaining because they say to themselves, you know, I don't really know enough about this race. I want those people to stay home. And yeah. as, as I think we've observed, because we had a conversation about this on our members only podcast, you should totally subscribe to Substack. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there's a certain category of American who probably should vote. And if they're not inspired to go out and vote, like, yeah. let's not encourage them. Let them stay home. You don't know what's going on. You're not interested in politics. The only way to incentivize you to actually get out and cast a ballot is to promise you sexual intercourse with those people. <laughs> I, let's not. Let's not. I think that the polity will be improved, <laughs> well served by keeping yeah. you at home. We should reward that. <laughs> Can I tell you, Rod Rarer, Um, he came out with a, <laughs> this is his headline in his piece, Democrats, colon, gerrymander this coochie which literally is a line from the song. So he's not wrong. And he writes, "It's this song is urging women to hold out on men who are not registered to vote. He, not even registered. Okay. Uh, if a white supremacist had depicted black people like this oh, yeah. as sex mad animals, we would never hear the end of protest. And we shouldn't because it's totally degrading. But this was made by black liberals for black people. Then he goes on, we're a long, long way from Smokey Robinson and Otis Redding. That's for sure. And goes on from there. I mean, it's not oh. a bad point. Like, this is how this group thinks. This is how I'm going to appeal to young black people by putting these morons on screen and threaten no access to the coochie unless yeah. you register. <laughs> Could you imagine, you know, I imagine myself as a journalist interviewing somebody coming from uh, the polling place and me saying, you know, who did you vote for? And they're like, I don't know, this guy. Why did you vote for it? <laughs> I, I just, I, I can't, I, I literally can't have sex unless I vote for the person. <laughs> you know what I mean? No, I'm super horny, but I just, I heard they're great, but I, I don't care now. I'm going to bring my sticker, my I voted sticker, and I'm going to be gone for about six hours. Yeah. That's really not what I want to encourage. I don't care about the actual optics of the video. It's like, um, and I will probably disagree with Rod Dreher in the sense that I think some of the lines are actually quite funny. Um, <laughs> which are a few. Um, but yeah, I, this, I am somebody who does not want to encourage more people to vote. I think that's a bad idea. I think people should be more informed and when they're informed, they should vote. I'm not a person who likes Australia, which mm -hmm. forces everybody to vote by, by, by law. And you know, there's a lot of people, and we talked about this on the podcast the other day, um, not voting is a choice just the same as pulling the lever for a Republican or a Democrat. Not voting can be a choice. And I often don't vote not because I'm misinformed or I don't know anything about the candidates, because I do know about the candidates. And that's why I don't vote. And so I, this idea that not voting is always a bad thing, I disagree. Although if you don't vote, you don't have the chance to comically write in the names of all of your friends yes. for all like the district court judge things that you should never vote for. <laughs> Someday I'm going to be a judge, aren't I? <laughs> yeah, I'm trying, man. I get you guys on there every time. Uh, all right, yeah. let me let me shift gears to something equally controversial. Equally. Um, okay, this is via D The Daily Wire. Happened Monday. There is an award-winning multimedia journalist who none of us has ever heard of named David Levitt. Uh, mm. He claims, award-winning, I don't know what that means, mom, um, he claims that he's written for CBS, uh, Yahoo, Examiner, et cetera. And this is a person who called Child Protective Services on Virginia State Senate candidate Tina Ramirez. Why, you say? What did Tina do? Did Tina hurt her child? Did Tina abuse her child? Did Tina do something that would make any sane person call Child Protective Services on her? No. Tina said, quote, I teach my daughter real American history. I refused to join the radical left's campaign to erase history and wished her followers a happy Columbus Day. So this <laughs> loser goes on to tweet, can someone please call child care services on Tina Ramirez, who is teaching her child to be a racist? Then he apparently decided to make the call himself and complained about the long wait time to speak to someone <laughs> <laughs> at the hotline, oh tweeting, the Virginia State Hotline for Child Abuse has a 10-plus minute hold and is experiencing high call volumes with the 14 callers ahead of me. This is absolutely unacceptable. How many people try to report child abuse and hang up? How many children were continued to be abused? Many, sir, because of you. 
tied <laughs> you're up jamming up the lines. Your, your Twitter followers, dude. <laughs> you are jamming up the lines and you're encouraging other people to do it as well. Like some young child might have been in trouble seeking help and you <sighs> and your asshole followers are harassing yeah. this woman on the internet. I will say right. that, that Columbus Day, probably my least favorite holiday because of the ridiculous kind of culture war antics that tend to, to dominate the holiday. Yeah. I mean, annoying. whatever kind of particular political historical narrative you choose to embrace, whether you imagine that Christopher Columbus was kind of just this bold, chaste um, explorer who went to America and found it and we should celebrate him forever and ever. Amen. Or that the, the noble savages were here living peacefully in bliss before anyone got here and have never done anything terrible or wrong. And the reason we should regard them as the first peoples is because God gave them the land and they never had to fight any sort of violent conflict or genocide one another or anything else horrendous. If everyone were equally upset about the fact that some people in the past have done awful things um, and therefore perhaps shouldn't be celebrated, I would be okay. Um, but instead you get this kind of selective outrage in one direction or the other that I find like plenty preposterous and nonsensical. And I wish we would just be it's a so little true. bit more thoughtful. I think there's so many interesting things to talk about. Maybe if not rebranded Columbus um, um, uh, Culture War Day, we could rebrand re it like Discovery Day. It was the day that two people, people just shut up and enjoy the free day off. And that was interesting. <laughs> yeah. like, if you're going to tax something, does it have to be a freaking holiday? People need their days off. They enjoy having the school day off, having a day off from work. Like, pick something else to pick on. You know, like, what good was done by taking that day back as a work day and a school day? Here's the ending of the, my little story. Um, Ramirez, the, the candidate, tweeted back to this guy, mighty bold and liberal of you to lecture a Hispanic mother with a black daughter on racism. What's next? Are you going to lecture me on women's rights? And then, of course, the capper from Levitt. Oh, he will. Having a black child doesn't make you any less racist. Yes, it does. <laughs> it absolutely no. does. That's no, not, it doesn't. That's crazy. Like, who? Do you, do you think, Col like, David Duke is like, Colonizer. I'm going to adopt a black or, or marry a black woman. And I'm David Duke. No, it makes you less racist. I think it does. <laughs> Camille, can you back They're me up on this They're just your beard. Moment? They're your racist that's, beard. That's insane. <laughs> Camille and I, I remember a long time ago, I had a conversation about this where Camille said something similar when somebody said, like, you know, just because you say, like, oh, I have a black friend, it doesn't make me, like, it doesn't make it less racist. And Camille's argument is, a uh, matter of fact, it does. Uh, we tend <laughs> not to have friends who are <laughs> yeah. black true. if they don't like black people. Yeah. This is that's true. <laughs> yeah, it's just a fact. It's, it's an empirical fact. All right, fact. so... Fact. We got around back. <laughs> Abby has gone and gotten me the pumpkin spice latte from Starbucks. Now, oh I have never had a pump pumpkin spice latte in my life. However, I confess that my hairstylist brought me an iced coffee with the pumpkin cream on the top. And Ew. it was delicious. You guys remember we talked about this the last time. I'd never mm -hmm. had one. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, and re refresh me on your stances when it comes to pu pumpkin spice anything. I'll go down the line. Uh, Matt? Uh, libertarian, do what you like. I'm not going to join you. Uh, nope. the, the only hate crime that I love seeing prosecuted. It's hate crime. <laughs> against it, Camille. I'm not a fan of the public spice latte. I think it kind of tastes like cough syrup. It's just weird. So you've tried it. it. I have you've tried, tried it. it. Yes. Have you guys tried it? Yes. I don't think so. Yes. yes and I, you still it's, reject it. All right. Well, disgusting. I've never tried it. I've never tried the actual latte. I'm going to try it now. Stand by. Okay. It's like Robitussin she's drinking. Yeah. Spit it out, do spit it <laughs> right at the camera. Mm, I'm, I get what you're saying with the medicinal flavor there. Yeah, I gotta say the the pumpkin spice uh, iced coffee. It's better. It's better, and it's lower in calories. I asked Sarah, mm. who does my hair, how many calories in this bad boy, and she said 150. That's not bad. You can like mm. that's sort of like a breakfast. You can get away with that. And by the way. I don't know what it, what's in there. It's like crack. You're wide awake for the rest of the day. You're like, I'm ready to go. So if you want to suck up that, it's like not totally consistent with the intermittent fasting, but for a treat every once in a while, I, I would stand by that. The latte, I don't know. I see what you're saying with the tussin. But yeah. the important thing about the pumpkin spice, and you mentioned, um, Megan, the word Karen before, is that this is the pre-Karen, right? Before there was a Karen, it was the pumpkin spice lady in the Ugg boots. That, uh, that's why people started hating it. It was like, there was oh, a no. very particular type of person who went and got the pumpkin spice latte kind of soccer mom with the Ugg boots. And uh, oh. now we've just, it's become Karen. So. Well, I know, don't even think that, it, if that counts if it's iced. I mean, that's a total, that's ice Karen. That's yeah, different. You're really trying to get <laughs> She doesn't have any of the same characteristics as the ice original. Karen. <laughs> that's the name of the band. There are so many delicious caffeinated beverages that you can get at Starbucks or any place else. The, 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 the attention 
that is given to the pumpkin spice latte completely undeserved. I think it is a subpar beverage. And I, I support the chai tea latte, although I believe that saying chai tea is a little weird because it's staying I support, tea twice, but I, I don't know. I support the chai tea. I love Camille's like methodical business like yeah. approach to this, just corporate yeah. America. Like, I, this is what I support. Well, I could do uh, an endorsement. Be voting for that. I could do one. By the way, I heard that there's the a peppermint cream that comes out soon, too. Ne- never too soon for that one. Guys, what a pleasure, as always. Find them at thefifth.substack.com, and you won't be sorry you did. <laughs> <laughs> 